Well, good morning, good afternoon uh, to folks, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, I'm Reverend Julie Taylor. I'm the president of the UU Trauma Response Ministry team. I've been with the team almost 10 years now and have a long time background in doing uh, trauma response work going back to 2001. So uh, I'm glad that I got the invitation here and that that trauma response team and that CLF are going to work together on this particular presentation and see about uh, looking at how to manage post-election stress reactions, which is the topic today. All right. So I uh, wanted to start with uh, just a little bit of breaking up the way we think about things. Uh, this comes from, you can see it at the bottom, a website that I always like for my sense of humor, despair.com. And uh, this is a poster that I have uh, in my office. It says, pressure can turn a lump of coal into a flawless diamond or an af average person into a perfect basket case. Because what we're talking about is stress and pressure. And in and of itself, stress and pressure, not they're not good or bad. It takes stress to be able to get through your day. It takes stress to be able to get through a program. Uh, how we deal with stress uh, is, is the issue of whether you're going to turn into a diamond or if things are going to go a different direction. Uh, use stress is a technical term for that positive motivating stress. And then there, we have distress. And then that, which is kind of a normal range of stress that's tough, but it's stuff that we're typically used to dealing with. And then you get into dysfunction. And we're going to talk about how to kind of look at the differences of how stress is working for working with you. So I want to talk, uh, this is a, a, a saying that a lot of people know uh, from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, an abnormal response to an abnormal situation is normal. Now, for a lot of us, when we're looking at that abnormal situation, it is not necessarily, listen, elections are normal. Losing elections are normal. Uh, but I think for a lot of us, the expectation around where this particular election is going was not what we were anticipating. So that, that violation of our expectations, and also for many of us uh, that are in marginalized communities, that expectation of, of Danger and what potentially could come is putting us into an abnormal situation in terms of concerns for safety and security in the future. So if what I'm and what I've already heard from a few of you in the check in we're see it feels like we're having an abnormal response. Because normally when elections happen, I don't feel like I can't get out of bed or I don't feel like I can get my head together to even make a to-do list, let alone do the to-do list. You know, stuff happens, it doesn't go our way, and we still get along with things. This is working out differently. So I just want to remind, and it can feel really, it can feel really disorienting. So if you're having an abnormal response to this abnormal situation, that makes sense, and you're kind of right on track. All right, so this slide... Now we're going to get into some kind of nitty gritty about what happens physiologically with us. Um, if you think back to uh, the fight or flight and how physiologically this happens, before we get into really looking at this slide in particular, uh, I want you to think about fight or flight. And when a stressor uh, is presented to us, if you think back maybe like Fred Flintstone days, so way back before we had distractions like internet and social media and television and 24-hour news cycles, you think back to Fred Flintstone days. If Fred and Barney are heading out of the, uh, heading out of the lodge and a saber-toothed tiger jumps in front of them, there's a stressor, there's a threat right in front of them. And immediately what happens is stress chemicals dump into your brain. There's about 15 of them, cortisol, epinephrine, adrenaline, all these different stress chemicals dump into your brain. When that happens, it causes physiological things to happen, like the blood leaves your hands and your feet. Blood leaves the extremities and pools in your core, in your lungs, in your heart, in your large muscle groups, enabling you to fight if you need to or run if you need to. Whatever the piece is, that's that fight or flight response. The, the blood also leads the, leads the frontal cortex of your brain and starts pooling back in the in like your brainstem, looking at uh, kicking in this limbic system kicks in, and it means you don't need to be able to do higher functioning and higher reasoning and higher cognitive stuff because what you need to be able to do is not have that distraction and just be able to deal with run fight. What are your options with that? So 
with that being the case, what that means is our cognitive is not working to the best of its ability when those stress chemicals dump. Now here's the thing about our bodies. Our body, our brain does not know the difference between a physical threat in front of us like a saber tooth tiger or a car coming in the wrong direction on a street. The brain doesn't know the difference between that and an emotional threat or a perceived threat. The brain and body treat them both the same. So whether whatever happens, your brain, uh, we're coming up on, on a holiday here when I know for me, I'm about to go to my in-laws and I have to bring a certain uh, kinds of food. And if I burn it or if it doesn't quite go the right way, that idea with the pressure on about a holiday, my brain doesn't know the difference between getting um, made fun of about the things that I bring to Thanksgiving at my in-laws. It treats it exactly the same as if uh, a car was coming at me when I'm on my bicycle, right? So whatever that is, whatever that threat is, be it an emotional threat, be it a, a verbal threat, be it a physical threat, the brain is going to do the same thing. It's going to dump these chemicals and it's going to, the blood is going to leave the frontal part of your brain and move back into the back that's only dealing with survival. So that leads us to this slide. If you look on the left part of this slide, you've got the orange bar of the graph that's really big. That's your thinking side, right? So in normal everyday that think feel piece on the left, that's the way that we're set up in our normal everyday walking around. We think way more than we feel. We are cognitive beings. So our cognitive is in control. Even when we're really like, even when we're really like emotional, we're still think we're still more cognitive beings when we're in balance because you have to be able to get down the street and get to the grocery store and all that, right? So you can still be in your feels and you still have to be more cognitive. So that's kind of our, that's our default for, for the majority of folks. Now what happens when those stress chemicals dump and we're under tremendous amounts of stress, when the pressure's on, when a critical incident happens, we move into what's happening on the right hand of the screen here, where now we are feeling way more than we're thinking. All right, and I don't just mean necessarily, um, oh, I feel bad, that's part of it. I mean the feeling like the more affect, affect is in control versus the cognitive being in control. All right, so when you're feeling way more than you're thinking, that's out of balance and that's out of whack. And that experience, because it's not the balance of where we normally live, feels really out of control. And in a lot of ways it is out of control because you are more in control when your cognitive, cognitive is ruling rather than when your, um, the, your uh, affect is ruling, right? So this is the place where a lot of folks are in right now. They're in their feel with their thinking not being so much, their cognitive not being so much. So one little tip and one back pocket skill, as I like to call it, uh, to start considering is what are some, some choices and decisions that you can make really simple things that start getting you back into your cognitive. What are little tasks that you can do that you can find mastery over that get you into your cognitive? Now I have two little kids and I have to take care of them. And that for me right there is a way that I've been able to jump back into my cognitive a little bit more because I got to take care of them and their needs over, you know, overrun my ability to just go into my feel. So any tasks, it can be, you know, when, when you're feeling so crummy, you don't even know what you want to eat for dinner or you don't want to make what you want to get at the grocery store. Those are the kinds of little choices you can make to help get you back into your cognitive. So that's going to be a running piece probably throughout this presentation is how are we going to move back into our cognitive? It doesn't mean that we're not feeling. It just means that the, we need to get more back into that balance of thinking more than feeling. All right. So now I want to look at some general signs and symptoms of distress. Many of you are experiencing different levels of these in different areas, but again, I want to bring this into a cognitive understanding and a, and a cognitive space around it. Some of you may know this from other kinds of training and things that you've done, and if that's the case, this is an awesome reminder and getting it on your fingertips, and it's also bringing it into that cognitive realm again. So the way uh, that I've kind of been taught and the way I, I work this uh, with this slide here is we've all got kind of five realms 
that are part of our makeup, our psyche, our person, our existence. We've all got a cognitive side, a thinking side. We've all got an emotional side. We've got a behavioral side or the way that we interact with the world. So that connects socially. It connects in how we kind of work around out there. We've got a physical side and we've got a spiritual side. So in these five areas, uh, folks can exhibit and experience signs and symptoms of distress in these five areas. And we're going to, if you don't um, get all these five down, if you're taking notes, I'm going to go into a little more detail about all five of them coming up. So if you didn't, if you didn't write them all down, don't sweat it. We'll get them in, you'll, you'll get them all here before the end that we're done. So I also want to look at, at levels. So there's a level, I talked about you stress, distress, and dysfunction. You stress is that positive motivating stress, but in this context, that's not what we're focusing on because that's not the issue right now. So distress is excessive stress, right, which is normal. So when you look at how this slide is, the Rx or the prescription for excessive stress is to identify it, to assess it, and then to monitor it. So that's what we do with distress. And, and you'll see in the slides to come, distress is that normal, it feels crappy, but it's still a normal level of stress for the situation that's happening right now. And that, and what this slide is about is trying to triage or determine what's, are, are we at levels of distress or are we at dysfunction where there's impairment? And the prescription, if you see dysfunction or you're trying to determine if there's impairment, you have to identify it, you have to assess it, and then you have to take action. If you are experiencing or seeing levels of dysfunction or impairment, as you can see, the difference between these two levels is one of them you check, you monitor distress to see if it starts to resolve or if you see it starts turning into dysfunction. But there are certain tools that you can have to deal with distress, but it's also in that normal realm. And I'm sorry, it's, it's a drag. <laughs> I wish I could say you could just make it go away, but it, it's a normal part of dealing with an incident or uh, an experience, right? What we're looking for is when things turn into dysfunction. And when things turn into dysfunction, you still have to identify it and see what it is. You have to assess it to see where it is. And if you know, if you see it's at impairment, then action needs to be taken. Could be in the form of going to see a medical doctor or a mental health provider or your spiritual director. Or for some people that are not ministers, their minister, which could, you know, their religious professional, their DRE, whoever that is, however that plays out. All right, so I want to go in all those five areas, just really briefly talk about some types, some symptoms that are typical in distress versus dysfunction, because you do want to be able to tell the difference between the two to know where you are and what you may need to do. So physical distress here, tachycardia, bradycardia, uh, I was an EMT for a while, and I didn't know what those terms were until I was an EMT, and that's fast heartbeat, slow heartbeat. So pretty typical uh, to have heart, you know, have more racing heart. Uh, during times like this, headaches are typical, hyperventilation, sometimes even uh, psychogenic sweating, which is sweating when you haven't been working out, fatigue, exhaustion, lots of GI stuff happens to a lot of people physically. For a lot of people in those five areas, the physical area is one of the places that a lot of people experience stress. It's really typical. Not comfortable. I'm not saying when I say it's normal, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's within the realm of, of normal. Now, when you're going to look at dysfunction, things like chest pain, persistent irregular heartbeats, right? The first night when I really started about 3 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday morning of uh, election, the night of the election, I woke up and, oh boy, my heart could not stop racing, except that it could stop racing and it's not continuing to do that. It did it for about an hour. Persistent Irregular heartbeats, that's not, we're not in distress anymore. Now we're looking at potential dysfunction. Recurrent dizziness, any kind of seizures, recurrent headaches. Anytime, oh, and this is just a general, anytime blood is on the outside, it's not supposed to be on the outside. So if blood's on the inside, we're okay. But any kind of blood and vomit, urine, stool, sputum, anything, if it's on the outside, that's dysfunction. That You need to get some help around that. Collapse, loss of consciousness, numbness, inability to speak, right? These are severe dysfunction and anything when we're talking about this anything in that dysfunction level needs that take action now what's a little different with physical than the other four categories that i'm going to talk about is physical you need to take care of that right away don't mess around with the physical even if you think oh it's 
you know, that's okay, it'll be okay. You know, it's always good to check in. When people have been under a tremendous amount of stress, it's never a bad idea to go. If you have the ability to go see, uh, you know, your doctor, go see your doctor and get checked out. It's never a terrible idea because physical stuff can change quickly and that one's difficult. Uh, any evidence of physical dysfunction, you got to take seriously, refer it to a physician. Any physical distress that doesn't remit. All right. It, we're not experts. I, as an EMT, I was an EMT for a number of years, and anything that turned into dysfunction was stuff that we took to a hospital. It doesn't matter how much level, what level of knowledge you have about it. If you're not sure, you're not the expert in it. Take it to an expert. All right. So thinking distress, and this I heard a number of folks talk about at the beginning. Sensory distortion. It's really bright in here. It's really loud. Oh, I wish I can't concentrate. It's just everything's too loud. Everything's too bright. Right? Can't concentrate. Difficulty decision making. Pretty typical. Um, guilt. Preoccupation. You know, with an event. Really, I keep thinking about it. It keeps going over. I keep running it over in my mind. What could have been different? What could have been different? There's a con confusion. Um, sometimes called a dumbing down, and that just comes from, you know, a whole kind of a lot of overwhelm and inability to do things like concentrate and make decisions. Inability to understand consequences of behavior is a typical uh, response in terms of the cognitive end. Now we look at severe dysfunction. Any kind of suicidal, homicidal ideation would be considered dysfunction, paranoid ideation. Persistent diminished problem solving. Not I can't figure out what to put on my to-do list. That's, we're now looking at, pers that's, a, that's over here in the distress. It turns into dysfunction when things become persistent. So for, not for the physical, but these other four areas, there's kind of a timeline that is, a, that these um, symptoms may be in the normal range. It's typical that, dis that you can be experiencing these distress symptoms for three to four weeks after an incident. And it can be really uncomfortable. It can be really uh, just overwhelming. But you can still be in that normal range three to four weeks after an incident. When you, what I want to like drop some seeds in is things become persistent. If, things, if your problem solving is not getting any better in three to four weeks, then you need to talk to somebody. If it's getting better, but it's not perfect, if you feel like you need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody. But if it feels like there's some change, that's positive. That's good. Dissociation, certainly disabling guilt. Guilt was on the other side, but now we're looking at disable, disabling guilt, which has to do with that functionality. Hallucinations, delusions, persistent hopelessness and helplessness. Uh, one, of the, one of the folks talked about feeling pretty lousy until they spent... Uh, a couple of days with a whole bunch of kids, right? Which changed, it wasn't persistent, then there was a change and there was an ability to see some hope potentially or some change, and so that's important. So emotional distress, certainly anxiety, irritability, anger, mood swings, you know, you guys can read these, I don't know to go through all of them. Uh, post-traumatic stress, which is different uh, than post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress is stress that happens after a traumatic event. Okay, and that's pretty typical, pretty common. Uh, grief also falls under emotional as well as cognitive, and that's pretty typical, right? In those normal, uh, normal ranges, the dysfunction is panic attacks. Any kind of infantile emotional uh, emotions in adults. Kids tend to regress under stress, and that's normal, but when adults really regress, then there's something else going on. Immobilizing depression. And this is not, I feel blue. I feel blue would go into that distress category. I can't figure out how to get my kids out the door to school. I, I'm so overwhelmed that I can't get to work. Then we're in a different lane here. And then post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a medical diagnosis, that would fall under dysfunction. And you, you know what? Here's the thing. With all of these dysfunct, trying to figure out dysfunction versus distress, anytime you feel like, I can't tell the difference, and I don't know where it is, and maybe I'm on this side, and I don't know, that's a referral. Whether it's your refer for yourself, if you're taking care of yourself on this, that means you got to take your own referral and go see somebody that actually can help sort it out. Go to a professional to help sort this stuff out. You don't have to figure out what it is. Behavioral distress, so kind of these social elements, any kind of impulsiveness, risk-taking, excessive eating, and this is where swings happen. So excessive eating, can't eat anything. 
sleeping all the time, can't sleep at all. Alcohol and drug use increase, pretty typical. Um, compensatory sexuality, again, that's, uh, or not interested in sex at all, libido is gone. Those kinds of swings. Withdrawal, family discord, pretty typical. Uh, hypervigilance, so being aware of everything. Shopping, I have this on the list, because really anything that you can put an anonymous behind can be in this kind of distress element. The kicker is, is that those, some of those things like shopping, alcohol, drugs, um, gambling, those behaviors are typically a coping mechanism. The issue is, is that coping, and that can be a successful coping mechanism for short periods of time. The difficulty is that some of those can flip and turn into dysfunction. And so that's, that's the part where just using a coping mechanism turns into self-medication down at the bottom. That's the kicker with that. So again, violence and social acts, diminished personal hygiene and mobility. These are, now we're looking at behavioral dysfunction. And then spiritual distress. An anger at a God or higher power or anger at the way the world is set up, whatever the worldview is, however you, you language that. Um, withdrawal from a faith-based community. That can happen, boy. You can have people say, you know what? I thought, I thought you guys were my family. I thought you were my support. And this incident's happened, and I feel like nobody's with me anymore. I think i got to step back for a bit. That, that can be pretty typical. And then looking at a cry of distress using theological language, that may or may not be so much part of what folks are experiencing now, but um, a cry of distress using theological language uh, to explain that is some folks, if they use theological language in their regular everyday life, when distress hits, they're likely to use that language. So, um, why would God let? Why would a God that is understanding and and ha really has the best, looking out for the best for all of us? Because you know we we are God's creation. So why would God let something so terrible that's going to cause so much hurt for so many people? Why would God let that happen? That, it would be a cry of distress using theological language. The thing they have to be careful of is sometimes when people use that kind of language, it's easy to think, oh, no, and to over-intervene thinking, oh, no, they're having a crisis of faith. So crisis, an actual crisis of faith is something that would be in a dysfunction, which is more along the lines of the systems that have been in place for me to understand my worldview and my place in the world and other people's place in the world and the, the way... <coughs> that my faith system is connected into that, if that just flat out doesn't work anymore, now you may be looking at dysfunction. Uh, any kind of, you know, listen, I'm done, no faith, done. That for people that had something in the, you know, in the past, that can be a dysfunction and any kind of religious hallucinations or delusions. So those are the five areas and things to look out for. And I hope what you're hearing both for yourself and others is you're hearing the difference between that crummy, lousy place of distress that may be there for the next couple of weeks, that may be there for a month, two months, and when things move into dysfunction. Now, I want to say, too, with that, because um, we're looking at the likelihood of regular cropping up of a new incident or reminders or things that are going on, you know, all right, we've had an election, but then we've got an inauguration to have to deal with. And we're listening to transition stuff and we're watching things on television all the time that can kick this stuff up. And you think, well, how is this, how am I going to feel better in three weeks when in three weeks we're getting ready and hearing about what the transition, you know, the new cabinet's going to look like. And that's going to kick me in again. So that's where we're going to get into some strategies here in a minute that you're going to need um, to deal with an ongoing kind of chronic stressors so that you can work on diminishing those distress pieces so they don't turn into dysfunction, so you don't wind up with impairment connected to it. I'm hoping this makes sense so far. Um, so another little back pocket skill that I want to talk to you guys about before I hit this next slide is it's really important, I think, um, for you to have a buddy, have an accountability buddy. And you may have that in the form of a spiritual advisor, colleague, something, and that's all cool. What, however you define that, define that. But have an accountability buddy for monitoring your own stress. And we'll get into one of some of the things that you can do about that. But I will tell you this, especially with having a lot of religious professionals on this uh, call. And for those of us that are helpers, 
we tend to pay attention to other people's level of stress way more than we pay attention to our own. And that just seems to be how we are when we're helpers. And that's okay, but that's another need for a buddy. Because, and then this is why you really need an accountability buddy. When they see it in you and they say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, we need to go, if you're not using your stress tools, then we need to look at those. You're more likely to hear it from them than you are from yourself. And you have to make a commitment, really make a covenant with one another that if you tell me that I need to pay attention to this and I need to take some steps, I will do it. And if I tell you, you're going to do it. This may not be something you want to do with a spouse or a significant other. Um, it may be you know your relationships. Sometimes we hear well from our spouses and we do the things that they tell us to. Sometimes that's the last person we can do that with. Find somebody that you trust that you really will listen to them when they tell you because they are gonna notice it way before we will almost every time. All right, so are there any questions that have come up yet, Meg, that we need to get into or questions that you have or things that I haven't hit yet? I have the whole screen, let's see. Uh, nope. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about resilience tools for managing stress in the post-election time. Uh, and a way to think about resilience, I've, I've started, I don't remember, I didn't come up with this, so don't quote me on this because I'm not that smart to come up with this idea. But at some point I heard this idea about resilience, not so much about bouncing back. And when any kind of an incident happens, the thing is, is that the past is one time, but you're never going to go back to the way things were because something has changed. And so resilience and uh, Self-care, I think, have to be more about bouncing forward. We need to bounce forward into what's happening next rather than bouncing back because that's actually, you can't really bounce back when something has changed so significantly. And so I want to look at resilience tools and thinking about this and making kind of a cognitive shift into how are we bouncing forward to cope with and to deal with uh, uh, the stress that's coming up. So with this, Again, I'm going to go back to these five realms. So here's the thing. I used, to teach, um, I used to teach stress management tools after I was in New York City for 24 years, and we just moved to St. Louis four years ago. And when I was in New York City, uh, right after September 11th, I wound up uh, being a crisis counselor uh, with the city, the uh, New York City COPE, one of the Project Liberty providers. And we worked with city agencies that had, all, that had been affected by the World Trade Center. Uh, and so... I did stress management seminars as one of the things that I did with agencies, the majority of which were in Lower Manhattan and had all uh, had to evacuate Lower Manhattan on the 11th. So people were in pretty serious and pretty dire straits. And so we were asked to come in and do some stress management for these groups. Well, the first couple of times we did it, man, people were like, stress management, I, I already have too many things to do. Why do you want to give me a whole new set of things that I have to do to try to cope with my stress when I don't have enough, I, I don't have enough time to do what I need to do to get through my day that I'm required to do. And that's a totally legit way to think about it. So in kind of rethinking about this, uh, myself and a couple other folks we were working with, we really looked at these five areas and started thinking about instead of coming up with a new stress management or resilience model for yourself, what I would encourage you to do is start thinking about these five areas and think about something that you already do in your life and how it can be connected to as many of these areas as possible, four or five areas. So I'm going to give you an example uh, coming from that time. So a colleague that I was working with, um, on, I was on site at World Trade Center for six months. And at St. Paul's Chapel. And a friend of mine that I was working with down there, um, a lay person who's a, a you know, lay leader in our congregation, and she volunteered down there. And before th that incident, uh, she used to do a ballet class once a week. Now, I don't mean American Ballet Theater. I'm not talking that kind of, I mean YMCA, ballet for women in over 50 kind of ballet class, right? So that was a class that she used to do once a week, and then she started volunteering and got overwhelmed and didn't have time to do it. And her husband actually said, you need to go back to that class or you need to stop volunteering. And he kind of pinpointed it. So when we were talking about it one day, we looked, and that one ballet class every week, it hit cognitive, 
for her in that there were new combinations that she had to think about and new ways of whatever was happening in the dance world. So there was a connection, at least cognitively. Emotionally, there was a connection in that for her, dancing and music connects for her emotionally. There was a behavioral aspect, a social aspect. It was the same ladies that always took this ballet class every week and sometimes went to coffee, but they certainly always talked. There was, so there was a connection socially. There's a pretty obvious physical connection there, right? And then for her, there was a spiritual aspect. For her ballet class, um, this mind-body-spirit connection that she got when she danced was really strong and part of a spiritual practice for her. And so what, it, what really it came down to was not about starting a new stress management situation. What she had to do was go back to this thing that she already was doing and make sure that she didn't stop doing that when the pressure was on. All right, so that's the piece, and that's what I want you all to start thinking about right now, and we'll break up into small groups in a, in a minute, but, you know, everything is going to be different. I, you can go, and I actually encourage, I actually really do encourage you to become a student of stress management. You know, hit, hit a bookstore, there'll be, there'll be shelves of books on stress management. They all say pretty much the same thing. So the best idea is to go and get whichever one you connect with. If you like research, find one that's research-based. If you like cartoons, find one that does it in cartoons. However you process information, get one. It'll give you a whole lot of options. And that's really important to know that stuff. In addition, what we're more likely to do, however, is something we're already doing if we're intentional about it. So for me, if I then, and so part of what I'm, why I'm saying this is I'm not, I don't have a list up here of 30 of the best stress ma management techniques because honestly, for everybody in here, it's going to be different. So what, like if I tried to take a ballet class once a week, I would be annoyed emotionally. I would be physically hurt. I'd probably not want to talk to other people. Like, it just would be a terrible mix. So for me, uh, like at the time, I going to uh, a basketball game. There was a, the New York Liberty was playing in New York, and so what I came up with for me was I had season tickets to that, and sometimes I wouldn't go because I'd be working all these extra shifts, and I was trying to work, and I wouldn't go. Well, I realized that for me, going to that one uh, basketball game every week or every other week became really important. Now. Um, so cognitive, it, I know basketball enough to be able to coach from the bleachers and know what should be happening and what's not happening. There's a cognitive aspect to that that I could connect. Emotional, man, if you like your sports, you know it's emotional, right? Behavioral, social, I had season tickets with some friends, so we would see each other, that's when we saw each other, so it was it connected there. Physically, I wasn't playing basketball, but these, at the time, it was $6 a six dollar seats at the top of madison square garden so you could take the escalator up for a while but then you got to take stairs there was a physical aspect to it which is all you really need to do to connect and for me and there is a spiritual aspect you know the new york liberty i think to this day have never won a championship so there was a lot of praying that happened in madison square garden all right so not so much but it hits four out of five really really solid so i started to make sure i went to that game and so I want you guys to start thinking about what is something that you do. Um, I talked with a, there's a minister friend um, that uh, within the last year we were talking and she's a knitter. And one of these folks that likes to knit during uh, meetings and just that's, is a knitter. And so she said, well, this is what I like to do. How is this going to fit into it? I said, all right, well, let's talk about it. So knitting, cognitive, new patterns, having to count, definitely knitting counts cognitively. Emotionally, for this, for, for this minister, there were times when it was, if she knew who she was making something for, she, could, she that was connecting emotionally. Socially, there were some times that she did, uh, she knit with groups and did knitting circles, and that actually connects to the spiritual. Uh, some, there was a group that she knitted with, and they would knit prayer shawls and blankets for, uh, for kids. And so that connected spiritually. The only thing then was really physically. And, I, and she said, well, what am I going to do? Like, you know, knitting is not particularly physical. And so actually what we talked about is when you go to some of the places that you're going to go to knit, if it's with groups, whatnot, see if you can walk. Or if you can't walk, if you got to drive, park a couple of extra blocks away and walk. By adding that one element, it hit all five. So start thinking about that. So here's the planning part that I want you all to think about. Think about your personal resilience plan. What is your personal plan to bounce forward? I want you to think about two things that you can do when it's really bad and when it's really overwhelming and when it's hitting the fan. So two things that you can do. And it can be, again, think about what that bigger thing is, 
like knitting or like going to a game or whatever those things are. It could be something like for every cup of coffee I drink, I'm going to drink a bottle of water. So it could be something like I'm going to check in with my accountability buddy. But I want you to think of two things when it gets really bad, two things when things slow down, but it's not in an acute place of whatever that is, right, that stressor. And then two things when things are kind of okay or good. So when, when things are back into balance, two things that you're going to do to keep your batteries topped off. And it could be, I need, you know, I'm going to make sure I see my therapist. I'm going to go out on a date night with my spouse or my significant other. I'm going to go to the zoo with my kids, whatever that is. And then make sure, think about an accountability buddy. So that's where I want to look at now. So can we, uh, Meg, I leave this to how you know how this works um, in terms of breaking into some small groups and letting people talk with each other. You don't have to have it perfect, but if you have an idea of a couple things that might work, I want you to start talking to somebody about it. So again, this is... This is information and hopefully things that you guys are all looking at and ways to keep yourself uh, resilient, be able to bounce forward regardless of what happens uh, over the next couple of months, over the next couple of years, really. This is practice. Um, you know, um, this is really, stress management is a, is a muscle like anything else and you got to practice with it. And it's really easy, especially for folks who are responsible for others, who are in helping professions, who are taking care of kids and parents and whole situations, we tend to put the stress management for ourselves on the back burner. And really, it's not wise. It's not wise. We've got, especially if you've got other responsibilities, if we take care of ourselves, we're better able to take care of others. And so there's, you know, I like to think of this somewhat as uh, in church terms, this is a stewardship issue. <clears throat> are we taking care of our own resources so then we can be a resource for others? And, you know, taking care of your own stress is, is going to be a, a stewardship issue. You, you congregations have something unique, I think, to be able to offer a world at a time like this. And if we really want ourselves and our people to be able to be there and to be a resource and not just a refuge, but a resource. Um, one last thing that I wanted to mention is, some of the pieces I'm talking about and some of the things that might be in your plan could be things like, you know, meditation, having groups. We talked in our group about connecting with like-minded people, things like that. Those are really important. And those are, those are great things for us to do individually and sometimes collectively at congregations. Let's keep in mind also a balance, particularly the topic of this around stress management for post-election stress. There's going to be a time, and we can go back to Ephesians, or not Ephesians, um, Ecclesiastes with this, with there's a time to come in, and then there's a time to go out. And so to make sure if folks are getting stuck in the in, that can also turn into dysfunction. It can go from something that is a tool to something that becomes the opposite of a tool. And so remembering that balance as well, I think, is important. I wanted to put up on the screen, if it's okay for, for a minute here, uh, Meg, uh, I'll share my screen just to get the, uh, to get our uh, contact kind of information. If people are looking for how to connect with the Church of the Larger Fellowship or with the UU Trauma Response Ministry, you guys seeing that? Okay. So there's uh, questformeeting.org backslash CLFUU and then UU Trauma Response Ministries, trauma, trauma ministry.org. 